This is October 19th, 2020, and uh, with regard to the coronavirus, all signs are pointing to the fact that we're entering another troubling phase, uh, not so different from the dark days of April and May, uh, and, and at least that was the case in New York State. Uh, and then things settled down in New York State, and things got a lot worse in other parts of the country, and now it seems that uh, things are getting worse here again, and in other parts of the country as well. So I thought I would uh, just pause and look hard at what we're facing, because the key thing is to be aware. It's always... It's always the name of the game in uh, this work, meditation, the Dharma, is awareness. Um, Many of you may know this already, what I'm going to be saying, but uh, I think it's, I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, first, uh, just to acknowledge that things have changed from the spring in other ways as well. Uh, At that time, uh, people seemed to really be taking the pandemic seriously. They were canceling social events, weddings, vacations, um, hunkering down in their homes um, for what we thought would be maybe a relatively brief um, period of isolation, important isolation. But now the mood has changed and what people are talking about is pandemic fatigue. Uh, just in the last week, the United States surpassed 8 million known cases of coronavirus and uh, reported more than 70,000 new infections last Friday. That's the most in a single day since July. 18 states have added uh, more new coronavirus infections uh, during the previous week from before last Friday. Uh, and that's the, wor- the worst of any week of the pandemic. The case counts, the coronavirus virus infections are rising in 41 of the 50 states. And so what we're seeing is, yes, an entirely different mood now in our country and not only our country. Um, in the spring, there was some hope and there was this sense of unity. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. Um, But now that hopefulness has given way to, well, exhaustion, frustration, weariness, public weariness. And uh, I think probably many of you can have noticed that there's a a growing tendency to risk the dangers of the virus, either out of just desire or necessity. And so more people are flocking to bars and parties and sporting events. But not only that, but um, millions have to return to school or, or to their workplace as uh, we're all trying to resuscitate uh, our economies. I remember the level of, of fear, you could almost call it horror in the spring. Um, that we don't have. We've, we have learned some ways to cope with this. Not that, not that everyone is following those ways, but... Now there's this odd mix of of resignation and um, 
heedlessness. Um, people are losing patience. And, and all this as the months are growing colder now, which means a greater risk of the virus. The virus uh, does better in the, in the colder, drier months. I found a few words from a, um, a professor of psychology by the name of Kim Gorgans, the University of Denver. She said, this is going to be brutal. I think it's unprecedented on every scale. She says the stress of heading back indoors. Uh, of course, this is all in the referring to the colder parts of the country, like you know, Western New York. The stress of heading back indoors doesn't exist in a vacuum. She said but is part of a bleak mix of concerns, anxiety over the presidential election, economic uncertainty, of course, the wildfires, unprecedented scale of wildfires, protests over racial inequalities. And behind all this, global warming, arguably the most, most, pressing, most important threat we're facing. Another psychologist said, uh, all of us in every circumstance are dealing with the cumulative toll of six plus months of the pandemic. We're moving from sprint mode to marathon mode, she said. She specializes in anxiety. And that she, then she added uh, that since these stressors tend to pile up over time, we'll be going into the winter feeling depleted and exhausted. It's not just the United States. Um, it's also Europe. Uh but not, it's not all over the world. Um, infections have, have remained um, relatively low for months now in uh, the East Asian countries, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and China. But uh, in the United States and Europe, we're seeing more frustration and a actual revolt you hear phrases, I want it to be over. I've had enough. This has been inconvenience me, inconveniencing me long enough, and I'm done changing my behavior. <laughs> so it's almost like a little tantruming. But it's, uh, there are very, very serious other consequences. The rate of uh, alcohol and drug abuse, suicides. I read somewhere that in the United States, alcohol sales in stores are up 23% uh, now during these last seven, last seven months. Um, that may be because so many bars are closed that people are uh, buying more alcohol in the stores rather in the rather than in the bars and restaurants but still 23% and so much of this could have been avoided if people were had been more disciplined about wearing masks social distancing and wearing masks it's not complicated and uh, I think many of us remain confounded at the resistance, the, the belligerence about wearing masks, of, of thinking one is entitled to do as one pleases. 
recently someone sent me a, uh, I think a very, very clever, um, sort of imaginative, uh, justification for, for not wearing masks. It occurred to me, um, a long time ago that it's sort of like insisting on wearing, uh, insisting on not wearing a mask in a crowded elevator. I've got a right to not wear my mask. It's so impossibly ego-centered. But then someone sent me this this list of statements, fanciful uh, statements, um, as if there were someone who insisted on driving at night without their headlights on. And here's, here's what, here's, here's the, here are the, uh, the statements that, uh, this writer came up with for this, this driver who didn't want to put his headlights on. I am not a sheep. I refuse to live in fear. I can see just fine. I respect your choice to use your lights, so respect my choice not to use mine. If other drivers can't see me, that's their problem. It may be a law, but it's unjust and infringes on my constitutional rights. Here's another one. I have a medical exemption, and you're not allowed to ask about that. And then finally, I'm a member of the Freedom to Drive in the Dark Committee. You, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And then we have the signs of hope, such as in New Zealand. Uh, Last week I. I uh, spent some time on the phone with uh, Amala Sensei, my Dharma heir in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, with her and her husband, Richard. And uh, she told me the marvelous news that now uh, their Sangha has been sitting for over a month now together in their Zendo. No masks. I think I, when she talked about how wonderful it was to be back sitting with others in the Sangha in the same room, I think I saw her eyes moisten up just a little bit with gratitude. I think we've we mentioned in a Sangha email that we're starting to talk about what it might take to reopen very cautiously, very cautiously. Um, that was before this recent uptick in numbers in our own Monroe County. So we may have to retreat again and put it on the shelves, these plans for uh, reopening. How, how wonderful it must be in, in New Zealand where where they've, they've effectively stamped out the coronavirus for the second time. The first time was in the, in the spring and then some rascal who was in quarantine, uh, what, what they do, and they still do this now, is for people entering the country... Uh, those people have required quarant- they, they're required to quarantine for two weeks in a certified motel at their own expense. But this this guy uh, found a way to squeeze out of the fence around the motel and then started um, a whole 
new round of community spread. But now they're, they're clean again. And a lot of the credit has to go to their wonderful, wonderful prime minister, Jacinda Ardern. She's become quite a, uh, uh, international celebrity because for all the right reasons, I guess her, her face has been on magazine covers all over the world. Her, her leadership style has been studied by scholars, Harvard scholars and others. And it's based her, her leadership about the, the, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus. Um, has been based on science and solidarity. Her motto in the spring was go hard, go early. And she recently, just last week, won re-election, uh, her, her party, she as the prime minister, and she's now the most popular prime minister in generations and, and possibly ever. New Zealand is only 5 million people, um, but still, they've only had 25 deaths. We're approaching 220,000. Yes, we're a much bigger country, but 25 deaths out of 5 million? They say she, uh, she was able to sell that lockdown in the spring with uh, straight talk and mom jokes. She became a mother uh, earlier this summer. And this, all of this, when uh, New Zealand had, had suffered a, a, quite a serious earthquake, many deaths. Amala Sensei uh, is, is at her next session coming up before long uh she's already decided to try a kind of a giving doksan and kind of a hybrid system uh she'll give doksan uh, in their zendo face to face in person doksan and then uh race home and give doksan dik doksan um via zoom it's just just what i had been thinking about doing uh, sooner or later uh, well, once we, once we've reopened to some extent, is, uh, yes, to be able to give Doksan at the center, but then add, add to that Doksan by Zoom for out of town members and others. As I was, um, meditating on this little talk uh, I thought of of uh, a simple formulation attributed to the Buddha um, you could call it sort of uh, uh, his understanding of the four universal miseries of human beings of people in the Saha world and these are the four and think of this in terms of the pandemic and the coronavirus and wearing masks and social distancing. These are the four. Having to do what you don't want to do. Not being able to do what you want to do. Not being with those you want to be with. And four, having to be with those you don't want to be with. Those four circumstances or conditions cover a lot of human suffering. Having to do what you don't want to do, not being able to do what you want to do, not being with those you want to be with. And last but not least, having to be with those I don't want, you don't want to be with. What uh, distinguishes uh, the New Zealanders and, yes, the Chinese. The Chinese, I just heard this morning, 
China may be the only industrialized country that will be able to report an actual growth in their economy. So yeah, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, South Koreans, what is it that distinguishes them? Well, yes, compliance with government orders, but the willingness to exercise self-restraint. Self-discipline, self-denial. These are, these are character, these are traits of character. I think it was Yastani Roshi who said, uh, Zen is the, is the perfection of human character. And these traits that we see in the national scale and these other countries, um, are all, all qualities that we, we have, uh, potentially different degrees that, and that are developed through Zen practice. In Sashin and outside Sashin. Stamina, emotional stamina, fiber, perseverance. This, this is where the rubber hits the road. And, and, and how, how many of us could have even thought of this even last fall? That we would be facing circumstances, global challenges. <clears throat> that would require us to come forth of these resources or suffer the consequences as we are in this country and and as they are in Europe. So exertion, this is all you could say is, is a kind of exertion to exercise caution, self-restraint, be able to say no to one's preferences, one's desires, to go out and mix with people without, especially without masks. Exertion. It's a kind of exertion. We learn through Zen practice how to push the envelope reasonably, uh, little by little, to to learn how to exert ourselves. Not, you could say it's kind of willpower, but uh, the other way of putting it is it's won't power. I won't be acting heedlessly, self-centeredly. I'm going to end with uh, one of my favorite, favorite uh, statements by uh, Japanese Zen master Dogen of the 13th century talking about exertion. He said, exertion is not something that people of the world naturally love, but it is the last refuge of all. This kind of exertion is now our refuge, and that's clearer than ever. Thanks for listening.